I'm Lorraine Ballard Morrill, and I'm so delighted to continue this special podcast in honor of WDAS FM's 70th anniversary. And what better way to celebrate today than to talk about the Reverend Louise Williams Bishop, who's entertained, encouraged, and edified millions of Philadelphians as a gospel music radio personality with an unmistakable voice that is as unmistakable as she herself. She has created an iconic legacy during her tenure at WDAS 1480 AM, whether as a pastor, a state representative, nearly three decades, or a radio personality, all three roles have one thing in common, service to the community. Thank you so much for joining us. I am so honored and delighted to be speaking with you today. And I'm delighted that you have chosen me to speak with today. So let me say thank you. And thanks for remembering me and all of the good work I thought I did at WDAS Radio. Most yeah. definitely, most definitely. Let's get into a little bit of the history. How did you get into radio? Well, I graduated high school and I wanted to be a communicator and they had a few people on and I didn't think I, they were doing what I wanted to do. And so I went to a television and radio communication school and believe it in those days they had one. And I graduated with a degree and I decided I was going on my own and radio was going to be my destination. Mm -hmm. I applied at WHAT for a little while, but WDAS was the station. So I finally got my dream. I made it to WDAS radio and I loved every moment of it. What are some of your early memories of being at WDAS? Some of my early memories was the fact that I was free. They didn't try to program me. They didn't try to push me in a corner. They wanted to hear what was in me. And so I learned how to do it. I remember starting with a show called Tiger Rose. I never drank a swallow of the wine, but I was able to communicate the importance of being able to have a social drink of wine. And that is what really broke me in. The wine show that I did, Tiger Rose Wine. They had a name and they named it after me. And my name was Tiger Rose. Now, when you were starting out in radio, there were very few women. And I wonder if you can share with us what it was like to be one of the few women in broadcasting at that time. I thought it was great. <laughs> I loved every moment of it. And I thought I was a new thing coming to radio, that I brought something new. And I was delighted to be able to share it with the city of Philadelphia. I had an advertising agency that I knew who believed in me and who wanted to own the Black community. Even though his parents, his relatives owned WHAT, they sort of looked to him a lot for guidance, and he wanted WHAT to own the city. He had one girl before me, Portia Perry, and she was very good. But he and Portia Perry, for some reason, did not go to where he wanted to take the radio station. I was the second one. And he gave me free reign to do whatever I thought I needed to do to bring in the city of Philadelphia to, and it really was WHAT. I moved from WHAT to WDAS, who came and stole me after they saw that I was making a big thing in the community. It was interesting. Yes, it's, it is fascinating. And it's just a credit to you that you were able to navigate during that time when there were so few women in the business. Now, who are your mentors and role models? I had few. I thought I was better than all of them that had been on. <laughs> and I didn't want to follow in their footsteps. <laughs> I wanted to build my own reputation. I wanted to do my own thing. And I talked with a guy that I was friendly with from WHAT who owned a work with advertising agency. And so I sort of expressed my dreams to him, what I wanted to do. WHAT hired me and he worked in an advertising agency. 
So he supplied all of the sponsors I needed to stay on the air. That's how I got my start. I was able to take Munch TV, which was a new thing in town, and build it in the black community. And it caught on like pouring gasoline on a wildfire. <laughs> <laughs> now, one of the things that is really significant about you is the power of your voice. During the time in which Dr. King was assassinated, Cities all across the country were rioting. I lived in the D.C. area, and parts of D.C. burnt down as a result. But you're credited with keeping things calm in Philadelphia while you were at WDAS speaking to the community. Well, to be truthful with you, I had a very calm boss. He was not the owner of WDAS Radio but he had had a lot of influence and his relatives owned WHAT where I got my start. And he sort of directed me in where I needed to go. I had graduated from Columbia Institute School of Broadcasting, radio and television. He sort of was like a guide for me or a godfather for me. I was his project that he was trying to use to take over the city of Philadelphia for WHAT. It worked for a while before WDAS recognized me and that I had more to offer than what WHAT could give me. So they came after me and I went to work for Bob Klein, Max Leon, and WDAS Radio. And to tell you the truth, Elaine, I thought I was somebody. And you <laughs> certainly were somebody. You were and are an iconic figure in Philadelphia. And certainly during the time in which you were on the air, you had a tremendous amount of influence in the community. I think I heard about a story in which a listener reached out to you because they were in need and you reached out to the listener community. to the and, community and to the community and they came out in droves to help. And you saw, I guess, not only the power of radio, but certainly the power of your voice to do good. Well, I saw that I was able to do the things that were within me. I never knew at that time that I was going to be called to do a ministry. But at that time, I wanted to serve the people in a way that would be helpful to each and every one of them. And fortunately, I worked at WDAS where I was given some reign, where they believed in me and they wanted me to do what I wanted to do. And I wanted to own Philadelphia. <laughs> I can't say to you I did, but I certainly was a voice that owned Midnight, and that's where I started. Well, I think that uh, everyone who has heard you on the radio will agree that yours is one of the most distinctive, melodious voices on radio. And I, I can tell you that I have been lulled uh, into a state of peacefulness. So many a time listening to you speak, you have a, a gift that um, you shared with the city. And you mentioned that at some point you did decide to go into the ministry. So the ministry became really integral to your radio career because you were very much a voice and a force in gospel music. And I wanted to be a calming voice for the city. And so I was fortunate that I went to work for a radio station who believed in me, who didn't try to hold me back, who allowed me to set my own pace, to address the issues I wanted to address, to play the music that I wanted to play. And really my desire was to own the city of Philadelphia. Now, I don't know if I reached that, but I tell you this, I'm delighted that I made an impact. You made an impact not only in radio and in your ministry, but also as a state representative over two, two and a half decades. What, what inspired you to want to go into politics, into elected office? Well, I had reached as far as I wanted to go, I believe, in radio. I was serving people, but I didn't feel that I was serving them the way I could serve them if I was elected official. And there were a lot of things I wanted to do for people 
the community that I didn't have funding to do as just Louise Williams from WDAS Radio. But as a worker, a community worker, working for a radio station, which would put me out there and allow me to do all of the things in the community I wanted to do, I was delighted. But what I didn't know, Lorraine, there was a spirit of ministry being born in me. And the Lord was trying me and starting me as a radio personality because his plan for me to move out and become a minister and to be able to heal and help deliver people who were hurting in the city of Philadelphia. And that was what I wanted to do. And as a state representative, you were much, very much an advocate for women, women's rights, and children. And so you took that service, that ministry that you talk about, and you made it into something that was very concrete, that really assisted women and children in the city of Philadelphia. Well, I think in Harrisburg, you sort of identified who you were, because we had come from all over the state. And you had to identify what you wanted to do. And it wasn't long before they picked up that I wanted to help the community. I wanted to help people. And I never told them, but I wanted to own Philadelphia. That was my dream. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm wondering if, are there any, is there any particular event or um situation that really stands out to you as a, as a very special memory at WDAS? Yes. I think people had started to come to me, to call me, to write to me. They had saw me as someone who could help them solve their problems. And I was getting all kinds of calls. I was getting visits. I was getting invitations to come and speak to them. And I realized that there really was a ministry being born in me and that it had to be more than just speaking to them. So I decided when the office was open, I was gonna run for state representative, which would allow me to help some of the people who had needs. And so I went to a very dear friend of mine who was connected with WHAT, his name was Lynn Stevens. He had moved on to an advertising agency. But when I told him my dreams, he was ready to reach out and direct me in whichever direction I needed to go in. So with his help, as a man in a big advertising agency, who's gonna deny him whenever he spoke a word? They wanted his accounts. So we became partners. And he started to push me along in radio. And that's how it all happened. Well, you've done so much. I, I recall your Martin Luther King events that you would do every year that would just draw thousands of people and uh, so many different events and, and activities. And oftentimes you would be that person that they would lean on to speak during very troubled times. You know, when there was violence in the city, they would ask for Reverend Louise to say some words. And those words were always uh, important words that really landed for so many people. Your, your voice has had a tremendous amount of power over these many years. Well, I realized perhaps early on that I had an opportunity to speak to people and they would listen. So I wanted to go the positive route. I did not want to speak to them in, in a party route, although a lot of them associated with me were party people, and it was fine. I didn't have any problem with it. It just wasn't me. So I had to work my way through a lot of good times for people, a lot of partying for people, and a lot of doing other things. But my feeling deep inside was I was to serve people, and I couldn't serve people unless I had been able to, I guess you would say, implement the calling that was already inside of me. Mm -hmm. I always felt as I came up in the ministry that I had my grandfather's spirit with me because I used to go with him all the time to church 
and I used to be involved with everything he did. Everybody saw him. He was not a minister, but he certainly was a head deacon at the church. And they would follow him and sort of look to him as an example. And while he would take me to church, he didn't realize I wanted to follow him too. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be like him. I wanted to be able to help people. I wanted the ministry to go forth. I wanted people to call on me when they were in need. So I think I captured the spirit from him, but I think there was a higher calling mm -hmm. that also pulled me all the way in. So I wanted to be him and he had moved on. Mm -hmm. Well, you were inducted into the Broadcast Pioneers Hall of Fame in 2013. What would you say about your legacy and role in radio history? Well, in my legacy and I guess in my role, I had always had a desire when I came into the radio ministry to be able to impact on other people's lives. And this might sound a little strange to you, Lorraine. It was a life where it was like a party time, where radio broadcasting was the place to go. Their parties were the place to attend. And so I came into a field after I graduated from Columbia Institute School of Broadcasting. I came into radio, which was a field where Everybody sort of wanted to party. Everybody was somebody. And they could push a button and got whatever they want. I was moving toward the ministry and didn't even know it. So I sort of set myself aside. I was not a party of the party group. I was not a good timing. And before I knew it, the spirit had begun to work in me. And I realized that I had a higher calling, that my calling was to help people who were in need, who were in spiritual need. And so I became, I went to school and became an ordained minister, Baptist minister. I've never regretted a moment because being a Baptist minister, helping someone else also helped me. And it helped me to raise four children when I was left with them on my own yes, and I yes. had to raise them still being a mother, still being a woman, still being respected in the community. So they became my children all by myself. <laughs> I had to find a way to work and to be able to raise them in a proper manner without going to somebody else, staying with somebody else, sleeping with somebody else, to help me raise my four children. I was just not going to do it. I had too much of my mother in me in order to do it. So it was a little hard, but God opened doors for me. He opened doors for me to raise every one of them decently, not exposing them to anything that was out there and enjoying them. And they were my pleasure after a while. I had nothing else to look to but them. I didn't want to marry anyone. I wanted to be able to raise my children. And thank God. Yeah. You did. And you have a legacy uh, that ranks over four decades of radio. Uh, an extraordinary legacy, a contribution to the broadcast industry, to our community. Your voice has been a powerful agent for change and very much a part of the WDAS 70th anniversary you are part of this wonderful family, this history that has made such a difference in the city of Philadelphia. We thank you for everything that you've done, for how you used your voice in the service of our community. We thank you for that. Thank you so much, Lorraine. And I guess I would close with this. Everything I did as a personality at WDAS Radio, I was allowed to do it. I was encouraged to do it because one of the owners, part owners of WDAS Radio believed in me and he wanted to own the African-American community in the city of Philadelphia. So every time someone came along who he thought had the ability to draw them in, 
he used them. So he gave me full range. Do what you want to do, Louise. Just do your thing. And you, and did, you, did, you did your thing to the benefit of all of us. The Reverend Louise Williams Bishop, you've entertained us, encouraged us, and edified millions of Philadelphians through your legacy at WDAS AM and FM. And we thank you for that. And thank you for spending the time with us today. Thank you, Lorraine Ballard, and you have a great day. You too.